I want to bring up to the stage Rob Reardon, who um, is a co-founder of these schools um, and has done some really fantastic and amazing work in, in the vocational ed world. Um, and also helped start our graduate school um, and is president emeritus. It's really, I could probably use the entire keynote time to simply talk about all of the things that Rob has done. So I will cut myself off and um, hand the mic over to Rob Reardon. Thank you, Randy. Thank you all for being here. I was just talking with Karen. Uh, I mean, this. This gathering is in my wheelhouse. Uh, uh, my life has been uh, has, has evolved uh, to become uh, kind of um, really focused on for the last uh, 25 or 30 years after having met Larry uh, on the notion of the integration of uh, vocational we don't use that word anymore vocational career technical and academic um, Education. Uh, I think it's very telling that uh, early on, when we're when we're talking about who we are, we're talking about who are the career technical teachers and who are the academic teachers here. And and as Larry mentioned, that's that's uh, a division that was codified in federal law in uh, in 2000, in uh, 1917 with the Smith Hughes Act, and it was a very good reason for doing that. Um, and that was that um, in in the uh, emerging need. Uh, for a labor force that could work in factories and in the continuing need for um, uh, to educate uh, people in ag agriculture and so forth, uh, Smith Hughes uh, channeled significant fund, uh, federal funding for that. And uh, those who uh, wrote the legislation were afraid that this, as it went out to states, this money would be expropriated by the academic side of the house. Uh, so they created a lot of regulations which said, if you're taking a technical course, at, then at least half of your schedule must be in technical courses. Um, and if you're in a technical program, you must have an administrator who has this legal status of a principal. So there, were lots of, there was lots of efforts uh, to protect uh, the technical education. Uh, from incursions uh, by uh, conventional and mainstream and university prep um, education. So that was a good thing, but it had a downside, which is the segregation of, uh, of uh, technical from academic education, and we've been living with the results ever since, um, and uh, we're living with it uh, in this room. And Larry and I lived with it for years uh, at Ringe Tech, where when I went over uh, Rinch Tech was a place that had a, uh, was a, a technical program inside uh, a comprehensive high school, Cambridge Rinch and Latin School. It was called Cambridge Rinch and Latin School. Um, and it was a place where uh, Larry and I didn't worked in the same building and didn't meet for seven years. Uh, it wasn't just that I was on the fifth floor and he was on the first floor. It was that technical teachers and academic teachers rarely met and almost never talked with each other. And when I met Larry, and we started talking about, I was running a writing center for the whole high school at the time and was really fascinated. Uh, but we did outreach and got kids from all, 2,000 kids in the school, 1,800 of the kids came through that writing center in a single year for help with their writing, and it was a peer tutoring operation. And kids from the Vogue program and kids from Larry's carpentry class came up for help writing book reports. A book reports, of course, are a, an artifact of schooling. They don't appear anywhere else in the world. Um, and so they struggled to write their book reports. But when I asked them to write to me a little bit about how to put together a circuit board, they wrote with some flow and with some authority. Uh, I was fascinated by that. And when I did meet Larry on some faculty committee, um, I started talking about that. And he started talking about his, his carpentry kids and so forth. And we began to have this conversation, and I started to work, uh, begin to work with Larry. Uh, we, the question we were, I was asking at the time with Larry was, what if we had kids who were working out in industry or in social service agencies in Cambridge? What if they were working out there and they had an academic course, a humanities course accompanying that work? And the text for that 
academic course would be their experience in the workplace. And they would access it through writing. And they would articulate it through writing. And they would publish it to the world through writing. What, if that, what, if, what, would, what would that be like? And shortly after those conversations, Larry became director of vocational ed. Uh, it was still called Oc Ed at that time. Uh, in Cambridge, and uh, Polaroid Corporation called them up and said, we want to do a uh, co-op with your students. Because Polaroid, at the time, they had 13 buildings in uh, Cambridge, and they ran their own building and maintenance shop, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, etc. And their uh, shop personnel were white, male, and middle-aged. And for various reasons, they wanted to diversify, and they knew that we could help them. So Larry said to them, yeah, we'd love to work with you, but we're not gonna do co-op. And they said, what do you mean? And Larry said, we'll do internships. I'll send a teacher over there to your conference room to work with the kids an hour and a half over lunch during the day while they're working there. And they said, okay. And Larry hung up the phone, called me up and said, we're in. Because that's what we had been talking about. And it was our opportunity to see what would happen if we did this kind of work. And for me, that was the beginning of High Tech High. Um, and I realized very quickly, um, after I got engaged in this work, I thought that I was bringing humanities to Vogue. And I realized very quickly, it's a two-way street, uh, that, that we, we had kids, if you walk down the halls of our high school, you were kids sitting in rooms with their heads on their desks who needed to get their hands on something um, and who, given the opportunity to get their hands on something and design and build and work with adults in the world, would then see the value of and tune into the things that they could learn um, back in school. So the, learning that, so, so then um, we were down, Larry and I were down with this new urban high school project. We were down in Washington talking with people in the Office of Vulcan Adult Education there. And somehow I, I, I was new to that particular meeting and I got introduced and somebody said, uh, oh, so you're a Vokey now. And I said, no, I'm an integrated uh, teacher now. I'm not academic, I'm not Voc. Uh, I'm, I'm integrated. I'm an integrated teacher. Um, so then later I became, uh, well, I'll, I'll stop there with that. But I hope that, um, my hope is, here we are together. We're career teachers. We're academic teachers. We're leaders. We're, we're K through 5. We're middle school. We're, we're K14 in this room. Um, but we're all teachers, and we all work with the same kids. Um, so I hope when we all work out, walk out of here, we're going to be saying, I am an integrated teacher, or I'm on the road to being an integrated teacher, and I'm integrating with others who are also integrating. That's my hope for uh, the couple of days. Larry already gave half my talk, so, you know, and I've decided to give a different talk, but I'm a prisoner of my, of my PowerPoint, so I don't know how, what's going to happen here. We'll see. Let's see. First, I, have to, I am the low-tech guy at high-tech high. See, I just messed it up. All right. Okay, Randy. Oh, the right arrow. There we go. Okay, so I did want to talk about um, Vogue Academic Integration, and I've talked about that a little bit already. I want to talk about learning mindsets, particularly the mindsets that have been, that grow. It's not just growth mindset in Carol Dweck's work, but it's also the work that Camille Farrington and others have done looking at what are the mindsets uh, that are key to student learning um, in, in our schools and so forth. I want to talk about them a little bit because I think they offer a useful language uh, for us as we think about our integrated work. Um, then I want to talk about some schooling mindsets that we, um, that, that, um, we are all beholden to, or that we all live in, they're the, they're the water that we swim in. Um, and, uh, and talk about a few schooling mindsets that I think it's time to retire. Um, then I'm going to talk about some teacher mindsets as well 
that are partly a result of the culture and partly a result of the schools that we work in and so on, uh, then I think also we ought to retire and propose a couple of teacher mindsets that I think is worth adopting and that I know that many of you have already adopted. Uh, and then, um, then I want to talk about um, three, uh, we're talking about integration, I want to talk about three uh, principles. I want to propose three operational principles uh, for integrated learning. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, I don't know if anybody has mentioned this, but my true title here at High Tech Eye is Emperor of Rigor. I'm now the Emperor of Rigor Emeritus at High Tech Eye. So um, I just want to talk about uh, rigor a little bit. I want to share with you uh, at the end my rules for rigor. And that'll be it. And we're going to have a little time to, I mean, you've been sitting already a long time. We're going to have a little time to kind of uh, talk with each other and so forth as we're going along. In fact, I'm going to set my timer here. Um, so I'm going to talk for no more than 15 minutes before it's time for us to take a break. And we'll know that it's time to take a break when, let's see, 15 minutes, when the dog barks. It's time to take a break, okay? And talk among ourselves. All right, so. Larry's already told you all this stuff. The stuff that you want to, you, if you want to pursue uh, questions, and by the way, our, our, one of our gurus is, there are many, but one of them is John Dewey, of course, you know, whose notion is that understanding derives from activity, and that's what drives everything that we do. Also, when we were on this um, uh, journey, this odyssey around the country looking at schools, uh, we visited uh, 16 cities and 23 highly regarded uh, schools uh, that, uh, in, in search of the new urban high school. And um, everywhere we went, and in national surveys at the time, students were when we asked students about their high school experience, they essentially were saying, nobody knows who I am here in this high school. They were saying, I don't see the relevance. I don't see why I'm being asked to do what I asked to do. And we were in a school in uh, Minnesota uh, where it was uh, 1,400 kids in the high school, and 400 of them were in career academies. And we were talking with the kids in the career academies with no adults present. Um, and so we were asking, they were raving about the internships they were doing, about the, 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 uh, the, the relationships they were forming with adults outside of school and so forth. And so we said, so if you could change one thing about your school, what would you change? And then and one kid said, some kids' attitudes. And uh, so we pursued that a little bit. It turned out they were talking about the kids who were not in the career academies. Uh, so we pursued that a little bit. And finally one kid said, look, it's like this. If you're not in one of these career academies, it's kind of hard to see your future from this place. Uh, so we knew that if we had a chance to start a school, we wanted a school where students are known well, where they're engaged in authentic work that they perceive to be authentic, and where, in fact, they saw multiple uh, pathways to their future. I, I do want to say, before I proceed any further, that sometimes when I am talking, I get a little emotional, and uh, I want you to know that uh, it's normal, it happens all the time, and don't be alarmed, okay? Uh, and uh, people, when, uh, people, when they're you know, here in this world, when they're talking and they start to get emotional, they just, hey, I'm channeling Rob. So that's the way it goes. So Larry's already talked about all of this stuff. Here's some figures and facts and figures. I'm not going to go over them, but they're on the PowerPoint. It's available to you if you want to look at our college going st stats and all this kind of stuff. Um, and our progression from 2000, from one little school with 200 kids to now 13 schools, K through 12, and a graduate school and all of that, it's all in there. So, but I do want to say one, uh, one word about um, our, our design principles here. When we were going around the country and visiting Tom Fehrenbacher School here in San, Di in San Diego and so on, what we tried to do, I mean, we were working, we selected six schools. There were a couple of very small schools, including uh, Deborah Myers Central Park East in Harlem. Um, there was Chicago Voc, a huge vocational school in the south side of Chicago. There was Miami, uh, Turner Tech in Miami, St. Louis Career Academy, Hoover High School here. So comprehensive high school, vocational school, small community school, and so forth. So where do you find the new urban high school from that? We realized what we need. It was not about a particular 
uh, model or particular format. It was really about design principles. So we were asking what are, the, what are the principles that all of these, that kind of bring all of these schools together and, and uh, are, the, are the bedrock for their work with uh, kids. And we developed some um, and then for that project. And then of course we realized it was really important at High Tech High to develop them. So we developed four design principles and we've just recently had um, uh, a kind of revision of those design principles in which everyone in the organization kind of participated. Um, and so now the current iteration is equity number one. Uh, we've always been an equity project. From the very beginning, Larry and I realized there were two things that we really, there were many things that we wanted to put in by way of internships and project-based learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were two things that we didn't want to let in. One was uh, social class segregation. So no tracking, uh, lottery admission, no tracking. We did not want the pernicious effects from separating kids out and saying, okay, you guys are gonna do this kind of work and you guys are gonna do this kind of work and so on. So social, end social class segregation. The other thing we wanted to end was teacher isolation. Uh, we lived uh, for years. I, I taught, I was a little, I'm a little senior to Larry and I taught in that, in that school for 25 years. Um, and lived with the, with the condition and the effects of uh, teacher isolation. Uh, you go in your room, you close the door. I mean, here you see, you go down the halls, and you can see in every classroom, you see what's going on in every classroom. Um, and in a sense, there's nowhere to hide. But in the sense also, there's an opportunity to share what you're doing. Now, you walk in the, back in the old high school where we were working before, all you would see was a, a, let, a narrow, uh, slit of glass on the door looking at it. The only way you could see in was to look through that slit of glass and more often than not it was papered over. So you couldn't see what was going on in that class. So we wanted to end uh, 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 teacher isolation so it's been very important to us to, to share with people the notion that teacher as designer is a really critical aspect of what we do. Um, and in fact when people came to us early on they would say, oh, wow, you got these wonderful design principles, personalization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have a copy of your curriculum. And of course, we were almost embarrassed to say, well, we, <laughs> we don't have a curriculum. We have teachers who design the work as they go along, and it varies from year to year, and it varies from classroom to classroom, even in a ninth grade, second, one ninth grade class to another, it varies. The teachers design the curriculum. Uh, we realized, though, that teacher as designer kind of understated. We're, we're into collaborative design, but we're also into students as designers and students as co-designers with what, with, uh, with around what we do. So anyway, so, oh, here we go. Oh. So equity, key, a key design principle for us, personalization that we know students well. These go back to those student surveys and the students we talked to in the 90s, knowing students well, authentic work, and then collaborative design. That's, that's when we face decisions here at High Tech High about where to go and what to do. These, this is where we go. How is this going to enhance our efforts uh, to have an equitable uh, teaching and learning environment for us? How is this going to help us know kids better? How is this going to connect us with the world better? How is this going to help us be better collaborators and so on? Uh, we're also in this deeper learning network. This is heading to where I want to talk now. This dog is going to bark pretty soon and I'm, I haven't even launched, but here we go. So uh, deeper learning, this deeper learning that we're networking, Hewlett is funding this effort to spread the notion of deeper learning and their definition is that we master core academic content, that we think critically, that we work collaboratively and so on and that we develop academic mindsets, which I'm gonna call learning mindsets, which is what I really wanna talk about. Anybody, anybody uh, can, uh, can have a program where they're pushing academic content and pushing mastery of that content. Anybody can talk, we all, here, oh, we all talk about uh, critical thinking and solving problems and working collaborating and everything, but the mindsets language, I think, helps us to think about ways that really require us to, ch to transform uh, what's going on in our schools and classrooms. All right, there we go. So here's the mindset ecosystem that, uh, that uh, 
grows out of Carol Dweck's work and the Camille Farrington and some other research at the University of Chicago kind of were looking in schools and talking with all kinds of kids and teachers and so forth and figuring out, okay, here's what's really necessary in the ecosystem for kids to, to grow and learn. The first one is, I belong in this learning community. If you don't feel you belong in a learning community, uh, the chances of your learning in that learning community go way, way down. Uh, this work has value and purpose for me, authentic work. I can do this work, the notion of agency and self-efficacy, and then, of course, the growth mindset. I can get smarter for, uh, through effort. I commend these mindsets to you because they offer us some, they offer us a pathway into questions that we can ask about our work and about the work of our students. For example, uh, with the mindset around uh, belonging, what, it allows us to ask questions like, what gives a child standing in the classroom? And there are many things that we as teachers bring into the classroom that actually separate and divide. Um, even if I uh, were asking, uh, if I say to you, you know, by the way, how many of you in this room have read Camille Farrington's book? Well, some hands go up and some don't. And right away I've divided the room into those who know and those who do not. Um, and in fact, if that's my mode, if I'm engaged in this teacher kind of uh, role play of asking questions to which I know the answer and which have answers and tip and continually the room is divided between those who know and those who don't know. And think about the kid who often finds himself in the group that doesn't know. What are the prospects that that kid is going to grow and learn in that setting? So what gives a child standing in the community? I'm, going, I'm about to say that what gives a child standing in the community is experience, his, one's own experience. If we honor experience as text in the way that we did long ago in the Polaroid, Cambridge Polaroid program, the experience that we're having here is a text to be unpacked. Then every child has standing because every child brings experience to the classroom and every child is having an experience of the learning experience that we're engaged in together. So what gives a child standing in the classroom? Where in this work do we see evidence of access and challenge for all learners? When we're tuning projects, that's one of the questions we ask. Here's this project design. Where's the evidence in the design that this work is going to offer access and challenge uh, to all learners? And where in this work do we see evidence that students are engaged in collaborative uh, inquiry and design? I belong in this learning community. It helps us, the notion that that is a critical mindset helps us to ask these important questions about our work and the work of our students. Around, oh man. I have, a, I have a slow thumb, I guess. Okay, all right, relevance. This work has value and purpose for me. Where do we see evidence in this work that students are exercising voice and choice? Where in this work do we see evidence that students are making authentic connections in the world beyond school. This mindset, uh, a critical mindset, enables uh, these questions about our work and the work of our students. I can do this work. Where in this work, in this design, do we see evidence? And in this environment, do we see evidence of support for all learners? Where do we see evidence that students are engaging in multiple uh, drafting and, and revision? Uh, evidence, in fact, that Failure is a learning experience, and we get up and we do more, we do another revision, et cetera, et cetera. Where do we see evidence of that in the project design or in the work that our students have done? And then finally, I can get smarter through efforts. Where do we see evidence that students are developing as self-directed learners? And where do we see evidence that they're taking risks and engaging in the transformation of uh, content? So, I'll say a couple of words about schooling mindset. We're almost to the point where we're gonna, we're gonna do a little talk among ourselves. Here are some schooling mindsets that I think that we ought to retire, and that we've tried very hard to retire here at ITEKI. One is that we separate students according to perceived academic ability, which always involves mispredicting uh, where students are. David Snedden and John Dewey in 1905 in the pages of the New Republic had a debate 
um, where they were talking about dividing into uh, high school education and those who work with their hands and those who, in the words of David Steden, their evident and probable destiny is to work with their hands and those who are going to go on to university. Dewey argued that this was inherently un undemocratic and also did not agree with, with anything that we knew at the time about learning. But Dewey lost the argument, Sneddon won, and this was what gave us the kinds of uh, segregation that we have now. Anyway, uh, it's a mind, and it's a mindset that's with us, um, and it's a mindset that it's time to retire. Uh, separating hands and minds, uh, and separating knowledge in the world into disciplines, it's a mindset that we need to retire. Uh, and then finally, the notion that we should separate school from the world, even in kindergarten, uh, but separate school from the world and high schools and say to our kids, you know, do this now, you'll thank us later. Um, and that, that, uh, that it, our sense is that it makes no sense to take those students who are about to enter the world and separate them from, uh, separate them from that world. Uh, so those are some schooling mindsets to retire. And maybe we could re uh, replace them uh, with some, uh, some, some other mindsets and develop other mindsets in our work. It's what we're trying hard to do here. Uh, we could integrate students, integrate the curriculum, connect school with the world, and now here, of course, connecting K-12 uh, with graduate education because we feel that the imp there goes there goes the dog. You hear? You hear? Okay. Okay. One more second here, and then we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to to talk among yourself a little bit. So. Oh, yeah, teacher mindsets to retire. So there's school mindsets that we ought to retire. Here's some teacher mindsets that I suggest that we ought to retire. First is subject matter loyalties. Alfred North Whitehead, in 1920, the Aims of Education wrote, the ancients educated for dispositions. In the 20th century, sadly, we have been reduced to teaching subjects. Um, it's time to educate for dis dispositions. That's what we do when, when we're at our best. But the notion, this, the, our subject matter loyalties, and the fact that we too often identify our sense of professional worth through our subject matter expertise um, is a mindset that it's time to retire. It's not, not that we're not expert at something, but the notion that that's what it's all about. Uh, is a mindset, that, and the notion that we need to be, when we're integrating with a colleague, that we need to be loyal to our discipline is a mindset that we need to uh, retire. Teacher at Transmitter, uh, Whitehead again, back in 1920. It's, it is time to, to divorce ourselves from the notion that the role of the teacher is to transmit inert knowledge, and that's the term he used, inert knowledge. There has to be a transformation of the content that occurs in the inter interaction between uh, students and, uh, and teachers. And then, uh, okay, career tech. Career tech is all about careers, right? Wrong. Career tech is about becoming more. And so is academic education. It's about becoming more than we are now. Tomorrow, as a result of this experience today, I am more than I want. I'm more tomorrow than I was uh, today. It's about becoming more. So when we were on this odyssey around the country, we were in a Voc Tech school in Wilmington, or no, in Delaware, somewhere in Delaware. And we were talking with kids, no adults present, and uh, one of the kids was a sophomore. She was in dental tech. And Larry said to her, um, so, what if you don't want to look, you decide you don't want to look in people's mouths the rest of your life? What happens? Can you switch? She said, no, I can't switch. And Larry said, why not? She said, I don't know, it's, it's just too late, I can't switch. So later in the day, the principal of the school and uh, several members of the community were in the conference room with us. And Larry said, Okay, so suppose you've got a kid, she's in 10th grade, she's in dental tech, and she decides she doesn't want to look in people's mouths the rest of her life. Can she switch? And the principal said, no, she can't. And Larry said, why not? 
And the principal said, because we don't want her to have wasted two years of her life. And Larry said, okay, so you're going to have her waste two more years of her life. Um, as you might guess, that school actually did not make it into our new urban high school project as one of our selected uh, sites, because that's, we were looking for something more than that. We were looking for, some, for career tech ed as something more than simply uh, in the careers. And we all know that. We all know that uh, careers change. We all know that we, we don't want to be engaged in preparing kids for jobs that are not going not to exist in five years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's more, much more than about uh, careers. And then this mindset that somehow uh, the technical side uh, of the house, uh, and I know that that's disappearing, and I'm sure it is in your context, but we lived in it for a long time, that the technical house was kind of a seen as kind of a lower order of magnitude uh, than the academic uh, side of the house. Parents saw, saw it that way, even kids saw it that way, teachers saw it that way. When I went over to work with Larry in internships, uh, people, a lot of my colleagues said, what, what are you doing that for? I mean, I was going to the dark side, right? We did get rid of that notion that, that, there's, that there's one order of mag. We need to integrate um, and not get into this notion that there's, that there's a, a hierarchy um, of, of, of worth um, and, of, and, of, and of intellectual heft um, in, in the work that we do. All right, so now, now it's time. Now it's time. You've been listening to me for a long time. So now's the time to, this is a, just find someone else. Not, not a whole big table talk. Find someone else. It doesn't even have to be at your table. In fact, let's have a rule. It can't be someone at your table. Not someone at your table. Find someone from another table. What struck you? What questions emerge in what I've just said? Or maybe you weren't listening to what I was saying. So if that's the case, just talk with your partner about what you were thinking about while I was talking, okay? We'll take about five minutes to do that, and then we'll come back, and I'll talk some more, okay? Go. Okay, raise your hand if you can hear me. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, say thank you and goodbye to your partner, and let's return to our seats. Okay, so hopefully uh, this is the beginning of uh, many conversations that you'll be having over these couple of days. Um, by the way, when we are, if we are talking about um, equitable teaching and learning and so on and so forth, um, and about experience as text, uh, one of the things that I encourage uh, teachers here, I, I think that pair and share is a quintessential high tech high activity, and a quintessential activity for equitable teaching and learning. Um, I just now asked you to say something about your experience of the last 20 minutes or so, and to share that with one other person. Uh, you share what you want to share. If, if we were then to share out, we would only share out what we heard someone else say, our partners say, and we would only share out what we have permission uh, to share out. Um, but the notion is, uh, what I encourage teachers to do is to engage in this kind of conversation about who we are and what our goals are from the very beginning and to make sure that our students understand that yes, you're talking with someone else now and before long you're gonna be talking with every other person um, in this room um, about their experiences uh, and their aspirations and so on. Um, it, it's all about kind of setting the stage for a feeling of belonging in the, in the learning community. Operational principles uh, for, uh, for integrated learning, or we might also say for equitable uh, teaching and learning. And as Randy said, uh, all of this is gonna be up on the, uh, 
the uh, project site uh, so that you'll have access to it. Uh, but the three uh, principles are experience as text. Uh, I've alluded to these already, but the first one is experience as text. Um, and the second one is uh, collegial pedagogy. Um, and the third one is assessment as dialogue. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, each one of these. Uh, the first, of course, I've just already asked the question, you know, what is it that gives a child standing in the classroom and, and proposed that it's experience as text that gives the child standing. Um, internships as experience and the internship experience as a text um, also gives a child standing in the world. Um, but I, I have to talk a little bit about uh, the work of Paulo Freire. Um, I had the unbelievable privilege of working with Paulo Freire back in 1970 when he was uh, a resident in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, at the Center for Development and Social Change. Um, and I was on the, the editorial board of the Harvard Ed Review at the time. And we were doing a special issue on illiteracy in America. And we decided, wow, Paulo Freire's in town. Maybe he would write something for us. And he agreed to give us something. Um, and he gave us a piece. It was a bad, a very poor translation, actually, from Portuguese uh, of a... Of a piece called The Adult Literacy Process as Cultural Action for Freedom. Um, and so I became, I was the co-editor of that issue, and I became the editor of that uh, piece, which meant that I was working very close associate of, uh, of Freire's, word by word, line by line. Um, and a lot of that got burned into my uh, consciousness. And it was only, you know, it seems... Uh, arrogant, in a way, to claim uh, Freire in a first world context. Um, and um, because he emerges out of the third world uh, in his work with uh, peasants in Brazil, for which he was exiled, and his work with peasants in uh, Chile, for which he was exiled. Um, so it seems arrogant to claim it, and yet over the years I've become more and more aware um, that, number one, we have, we have that, that Freire's methodology is as important for first world context and for mixed first and third world context as it was for his own context. And um, so when we were, I don't think it found its way into that article, but when I was talking with uh, his colleague and then I'm with Freire some, I learned something about his method and I want to be very concrete about it. When he was working with peasants in Brazil, uh, under this uh, mandate to uh, up the literacy rates, uh, I mean, the first Freire understood right away that literacy for these uh, peasants was not first and foremost about reading the word, it was about reading the world. And so he would put uh, these, uh, the students, and he hated, he didn't even like to use the word student. Um, the teacher and student was not he, we did all kinds of gymnastics to avoid staying teacher and student in this article because he didn't want to imply that kind of hierarchical. I just dropped the mic. No, I dropped the, I'm going to drop the mic in a second. Um, he, uh, so he didn't want to do that. So we was educator, educatee, and all that kind of stuff. But he would put uh, the, thank you, Charlie. I have so many people around here that help me. Um, put them in circle, what they call cultural circles, and they would talk about their lives. That's what they did. They talked about their lives. And there was a facilitator there. And the facilitator would be thinking, okay, what are the, what are the key artifacts? What's emerging in this conversation that we can really talk about and make the content of our literacy instruction? Uh, so, for example... Um, there, after, after all this talk and so forth, uh, they decide on an artifact and they flash up on the screen. This was the days of slide projectors, right? So they slide, flash a slide up on the screen. It's a picture of a tractor. And so they say, what's this? 
And the, the group would say, oh, yeah, that's, that's a tractor, it's a, a trattore, Portuguese, a syllabic language, and phonetic. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tractor. And so they facilitate, well, who's got a tractor? They say, oh, yeah, the patron, over, the patron down the road, he's got the tractor. And then they would say, well, how come he's got a tractor and you don't have one? Um, and so they begin to unpack uh, the relationships and the, and, the, and the structural relationships of their lives. And then, under the, uh, the image of the tractor, they would flash the word, tra-to-re. And the peasants would see that these, this symbol um, brought into life, brought to life all that they had been talking about. And they realized, they began to realize that, that words could speak for them. Uh, not simply the written, written word didn't simply speak to them, it could speak for them. Uh, the tractor was a mediating object. Um, and the role, the critical role of the teacher, of the facilitator, I shouldn't say teacher in Freire's presence, right? The, of the facilitator was to select the mediating object out of these conversations. So, um, oh, how did I get there? Oh, I dropped this and we got to another thing. So here we go back. So, but there's a whole constellation around this where it's cultural circle. That's, that's the context in which we do uh, teaching and learning. Mediating objects, that's what we look at together. And teacher or educator and educatee look at this mediating object together. Um, and each brings experience and expertise to that conversation about uh, the mediating object. And most important, maybe not most important, but very important, what is happening there is that we are bringing together uh, what we might call the theoretical context of reflection about our lives with the concrete context um, of our lives. And as I think about what we're attempting to do um, at Haitekai, I realize over the, I have realized over the years that so much of it has come out of, to, to, to the extent that I've had any influence on it, has come out of those, that early uh, relationship. Um, in that early encounter with the work of Freire, because when you walk around here, and you can walk around, when you walk around, see if you see anything like this. I hope you do. Um, you'll see it in spots anyway, uh, where the students are engaged in a circle, in a cultural circle, where they're looking at something together, um, and where, in fact, they're bringing together kind of uh, uh, observation um, and reflection. And, in fact, the graduate school of education that we're doing here is one giant project in integrating the theoretical and the concrete uh, uh, context of, of teaching and learning. So that's, that's the first part of experience as text. That's one operational principle that I commend to your uh, consideration uh, for integrated teaching and learning. And then collegial pedagogy. I always think of... Um, this is so up of youth radio in the Bay Area, um, where the kids come together. It's after school. Some kids are in school. Some kids are not. Um, and they develop radio scripts, which they then market to NPR and other outlets. And they're, they're all about investigating issues in the community and hearing testimony from, from people in the community and so on. And, and they do it in such a way they're picking up all kinds of technical stuff, uh, but they're also engaging in the community and making uh, contributions to, to uh, community dialogue. And there's this wonderful process that Lissa Soap describes where when they are developing a piece, they're all around the table and they're looking at the script or they're hearing it together, and it's what she calls swarming. It's a process of critique where, you know, we talk about critique and setting it up, and here are the steps, and here's how to do it. You first, you do, uh, you know, kind feedback, and then you do this, and you do that. This goes beyond that because it's just swarming, where everyone is gathered around, and they can't wait to get in with their ideas and their suggestions and their commendations and so forth. And critique has become a... A, an integral and organic part of their uh, community processes. Uh, something 
to aspire to in our work here at Haitekai and in your work with kids that you're developing project work and developing processes of, of critique around it. High School Recording Arts, also known as Hip Hop High, that Randy referred to uh, earlier, also engaged in this kind of work of uh, producing stuff from their own lives and from, from the community and putting it out there, transforming it in some form um, into rap, into dance, now spoken word, but transforming it in some way um, and putting it out there for the community to, uh, to appreciate. Uh, but the most important thing for me about uh, the notion of collegial pedagogy um, it's a collegial pedagogy is where I, as the teacher, am in the classroom with some, but with some students, and we are investigating an issue together uh, to which none, none of us has the answer or the solution. Um, so I walk, you know, I walk into a classroom, and uh, on the first day, or the second day, or the fiftieth day, and I say, okay, yeah, you know, really, it's time to listen up because I have studied this subject, and. I'm older than you, and I'm getting paid to do this. So, so listen up. So all of those things are in the dynamic. They're in the relationship when I walk into the classroom. But they are not the authentic basis for authority. Um, they are, um, they're there, but they're not the real basis for authority. The real basis for authority is that we have a shared purpose here. We're moving toward a shared purpose, and that my authority rests from the notion that I am the custodian of our shared purpose. Uh, so that's, that's where I derive my authority. But you also are custodians, so the authority is shared in that way. So collegial pedagogy and experience as text both help us to overturn um, the inauthentic uh, basis for authority and establish authority relationships in the classroom on, a, on an authentic basis. Uh, collegial pedagogy, just a couple of things. This is middle schoolers. Uh, we were building a new um, uh, K-5 school in Chula Vista. They needed a playground. Sixth graders learned to do SketchUp with their teacher who didn't know how to do it before he started. Learned to do SketchUp and created designs for the playground. Um, they were working in teams. Um, that got about 20, 20 or so designs, submitted them to the facilities guy who used some of the aspects, came back and told the kids, here's what I've used from your designs, thank you. And when they had the grand opening of that school, the kids were there up on stage as, part, as designers uh, of the thing. Sixth graders, um, another design. Another group, this was eighth graders. The teachers went in and said, okay, wh what do you want this room to look like? Uh, you know, we're going to be here together. What do you want this classroom to look like? <laughs> they, they tore down everything. They just changed everything. You notice it's in the back there, it looks like, kind of looks like a Starbucks. You know what I mean? Uh, so there are places where you can sit at the computer in the back. There are work tables. And over here on the, on the right, you can't see it, but uh, um, a big sofa, uh, a comfortable place to, to sit and so forth. So, so they designed it and they built it uh, together. Oh. And just the notion of, okay, so yeah, this is high tech high. You can do this in high tech high, but what about where I live? This is uh, Chai Tech uh, in Chicago, on the south side of the loop uh, in Chicago. Um, we started working with them because they came to us and they said, we're about, to be, uh, we're about to be shut down by the district because our test scores are low. Uh, and they told us we have to have an external manager Will you, and we put out an RFP and nobody wanted to do it. Will you do it? And we said, uh, no, we're not gonna, no, we, we, no we're, we don't manage from afar like that. We don't do that. Um, but what we will do uh, is to help you build capacity internally. Um, and they said the district will never agree with that. And we said, well, we'll go to the district with you. Um, and we convinced the district to let them uh, build internally in collaboration with us. So this is a school where when Larry and I first went to visit, they said, oh, just walk down the halls, go into any classroom. We couldn't get into any classroom because all the doors were locked. And then we discovered that if, uh, if a student wanted to go to the bathroom, the teacher called security. And security came to escort the kid to the bathroom and wait and bring the kid back to class. And we said, this feels like a prison. And they said, what do you mean? <laughs> And then they sent, 
we began to work together. They sent 11 teachers out here. They had 33 teachers. Uh, 10 did not come back the next year. 11 came out here a month later to see what we were going. They said, oh, I see what you mean. Um, and then by uh, the following February, they had their first exhibition of learning with kids standing by their work, proud of that work. Kids who teachers thought had checked out emerged during this um, exhibition. It looked to me like the first exhibition here at High Tech High. And then I went to the second exhibition there, and it looked like the second exhibition where the ceiling for the first one becomes the floor uh, for the second one. But here's just a little bit, uh, a little uh, narrative of a particular project there. This is where, you know, you come into the school, you go through metal detectors and so on. This is what the, what the hallways look like. Kids decided and teachers decided together, we got to do something about, they, they saw some of what was on the, on the walls here. You'll see it as you go around. We need to have an environment that reflects work that we have done and reflects our ownership of this community and these hallways. So they decided they were going to build, uh, they were going to build an organ and put it up on the wall, on the wall of, of a staircase. So this is just a couple shots of them doing it. This is the organ that's just beginning. It's, it's called, the project was called Making Waves. And there, oops, why does, it's just, this is my favorite photo. I mean, these are the kids standing by their work uh, in a hallway. And when you walk through that school now, there's stuff up everywhere uh, that kids have done. And, kids come, and teachers are telling us, you know, a tile fell off uh, one of the displays. The kid picked it up off the floor and went to the teacher said, can you help me put this back on? It wasn't the kid's project. It was somebody else's project. Can you help me uh, put this back, repair this and put this back and so on. So anywhere. Assessment is dialogue. So I could ask you, I'll go, you know, Campbell's law is this. The more any quantitative social indicator is used um, to uh, for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption uh, processes. Uh, so what makes sense for us uh, in terms of assessment? So let's leave, with that, leave that for a second. So let's think about here we are together, right? And you've been listening to me, you've been listening to Larry, and so what is the learning experience, I hope, but how would you like to be assessed? How would you like to be assessed? Think about that. Shall I give you a grade? Shall I give you a grade uh, based on your, you know, whether I think you've been tuned in or not? Or shall I ask you to write a paper? If we were to have an assessment of your experience here, you would insist, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what I learned, right? So we would need to be dialogical in that way, but you might also want to say, wait a minute, what you were talking about, I've been there. I've done, I, it was not, there was nothing new to me. Or you might say, I don't think what you were saying was really relevant to me. You would want to assess the quality of the experience, right? in the context in which it occurred. So here's my recommendation for a, an operational principle for integrated and equitable teaching and learning. It makes no sense to, uh, if we're trying to engage in learning 2.0, it makes no sense to assess learning 2.0 with assessment 1.0. So what does assessment 2.0 look like? We don't have all the answers to that. We're all working together to try to get there. But there are a couple of things we can say about it. Maybe. OK. We know already that it's ongoing and it's formative. We know that. It's not just the teacher who says this, that we engage in peer critique and so on. Um, but assessment 2.0 is dialogical, number one. 
And number two, assessment 2.0 uh, understands that every performance of learning occurs in a context. So when we assess the performance, we must also assess the context. This is why, you know, we do student-led comments here, uh, where we ask students to write a comment on the experience they've had. Maybe it's a project, maybe it's a semester's work. Um, and that's, that's where it starts. And then the teacher responds to that. But my sense of this is, so then we ask, what does the, what does the student, student let, what does the student part of the comment look like? What ought it to look like? Well, yeah, we want to, I want to assess my performance, where, where I was strong, uh, what my needs are, what my next steps are. But my sense of it is that the first question for a student-led comment ought to be, how did this experience work for you? Uh, the first piece of the assessment is an assessment of the experience and the context. And then we can talk about uh, performance and so forth. That's assessment 2.0 uh, for me. And these things, these three things, experience as text, collegial pedagogy, and assessment as dialogue, it doesn't matter if we're technical teachers or academic teachers, or integrated teachers, or what the context is, these are things that can apply and that can help us, whatever our context is, uh, to work toward uh, integrated and equitable uh, teaching and learning. I'm gonna skip over that. And I think, I'm just gonna stop right here because I think it's time to go to Q&A. So I really want to engage with you guys in uh, some back and forth, um, but I also want to give you some time to talk with each other. So we're going to take another talking break, and I'm going to ask you again, not somebody at your own table, find somebody else, somebody new this time. Um, and the question is, what questions are emerging for you? What are some of your reflections on back, what's happening back home, your experience that you bring here, um, and what questions emerge so that we can engage in a bit of dialogue together in about five minutes, okay? Five minutes, we'll be, find someone, introduce yourself. Five minutes, we'll be back here for a little Q&A, all right? Go. So we're at a traditional high school setting, and, and um, I like uh, everything we talked about. We're with a, a team of people that does the, the career tech education and, and really emphasizes getting kids prepared, career ready, uh, that idea. But we're also tied to things like ne next generation science standards and standardized testing. And a lot of this um, that the, the rest of the school has to deal with, the question is, Where's, where does it cross? Uh, you know, I, I've seen the results and, and the effect of being able to get kids involved and, and hands-on, but we're so driven by this other model. Um, it, we continue to be, the, what you said, the vocational. You, oh, you're vocational. You, and I'm like, I don't teach a real science. I'm like, are you kidding me? I, I think I'm preparing more kids than some of you guys are. So uh, that question is, where does that cross? Where's the crossroads on that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, what we say, first of all, all of our kids take all the, all the standard life tests that your kids take. So they, all, they take them all. Um, we pay less attention to the um, statewide, uh, statewide tests than we do to the SAT and the ACT. So you will find in some of our classrooms, a math science classroom, for example, 11, 11th grade, whatever, the teacher has the kids for two and a half hours, 20 minutes are devoted to SAT prep. So it's not like we're all projects all the time. We understand that those particular tests have a bearing on the kids' lives. Uh, so we need to really, uh, we need to help uh, with that. But as far as the other tests go, our take is this. What we say to teachers is, don't start with the standards. When you're designing a project, don't start with the standards because the standards will suck the life out of your classroom. Okay? Really. So instead, start with life. Start with what you think will be authentic and engaging work, something that you can be engaged in and that you think your students will be engaged in and co-design it with your students so that they do get engaged from the very beginning. And when you've got that design 
And when you're engaged upon, the, when you're embarked upon the work, then look at the standards. Because if you've done something that's authentic and springs from life, and you're using your discipline not as a body of content to transmit, but as a lens for understanding the world, it's a pretty good bet that you're addressing a lot of the standards because the standards do come from life. What happens in the translation is all the life leaves them when they get on the page. But if you're doing something that comes from life, you're going to find your way back to the standards. And then you can say, well, we've addressed standard 1.3, 1. Oh, 1. and, and we've addressed standard 3.2, but we're kind of missing standard 4.7. So maybe we can pick that up on the next project, or maybe that's not really that important, or maybe we need to, it's so important, we need to do it through direct instruction or some other means. But the, the, the quick answer is, it, it's death to start with the standards in your, in your, in your project uh, planning and so forth. Um, and when, if your classroom is a living classroom, then that gives you some uh, ground upon from which to then look back at the standards. That's what we. That's the way we try to approach it. One more question. Is it time for one more? Yeah, definitely. Time for two more. Sure. Okay, time for two more questions. Who's brave? All right. Here and then here. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, one of the things we were talking about in our little dyads here was how do you measure student engagement? That yeah. seems to be one of the key factors that, yeah. that we're looking at as, a, as an outcome, but how do you measure that? Yeah, good question. Uh, good question. And it's a great question for you to think about as you're, as you're going out uh, and observing uh, kids at work, kids and teachers at work in here. Um, are the kids engaged? Can you see it? How do you know? How do you know they, they're engaged or not? One way you can figure out is to ask them. Um, and so uh, the, the business of measuring kids' engagement takes us back to assessment as dialogue. Um, and so then the question is, are, are students reliable narrators about their own experience? Um, are they just simply saying that they're engaged because they know that's what you want to hear um, or not? Um, so there, I, I think that there's, there's observation and there's dialogue. Um, and there are ways that, you know, one of the things that we do is, uh, is we use uh, youth truth. Um, and there are other things that nationally normed um, uh, student surveys, we administer them here, and all kinds of questions about uh, belonging, engagement, and so on. And they're anonymous uh, so that we get reports back upon about what our students are reporting about their experience uh, here. So there are ways to get at it that are actually nationally normed um, as well. Thanks for the question. Great question. Uh, engagement, also how do you measure soft skills? Um, well, I think we start measuring soft skills by not referring them as, as soft skills anymore. Uh, they're essential skills, okay? So there's lots of basic skills that are basic to making your way in the world, and then there are some essential skills that are essential to uh, becoming who you are as a human being uh, with other human beings. So soft skills, no. Essential skills, yes. Yeah, one more question, and I think I, it's time for you guys to get out and uh, observe, so. This is the awkward part for teachers when we're like, where is that one question? Especially if it's, you know, right at 4 o'clock and it's time to go. Who's going to ask another question? Go ahead. I'm wondering, uh, do you measure student mindset or do you assess it as part of like a grade or is that anything that students are given direct feedback on? I missed one word there. Do you mention student what? Student mindset. Mindsets. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so we do not uh, impose upon our teachers a particular template or way of going about it. So then, so then the question was, would be, are there any teachers in this setting who are uh, engaging in assessment of mindsets uh, with their students? And the answer is yes, uh, that there are, student, there are teachers, for example, at High Tech High Media Arts, over that way, um, who have developed a kind of, it's, 
but it's it's a it's a program for dialogue uh, with kids about uh, what are the ways in which uh, you have uh, become a member of this community? What are the ways in which you, your confidence has increased and so forth? So, and it happens in advisory groups uh, where kids are talking about their overall experience, not simply they're talking with their math teacher about their growth mindset and math and stuff like that. So there are ways that, uh, that we do uh, go at it um, and, and there are ways that we go at it in our conversations amongst ourselves as teachers about how are we, how useful are these, is the mindset ecosystem or that notion to us in assessing student work and how do we go about, about doing that? Yeah. There's one more, there's a very important question over here. Um, I, I really appreciate your mentioning of Frary as a, as a, a basis in your, in your pedagogical understanding. It yeah. uh, makes my heart sing. Um, so my question is, how do you, I notice a lot of like your teacher leaders are very young. Um, the teachers locally that I know connected with the school are very young. So when we're talking about bringing folks to like this pedagogical mindset, how do you work with teachers? I mean, and then I look around this room, a lot of us are older or like 40 plus, right? Um, you know, cause you're really talking about like education for liberation, which is the opposite of how many of us were schooled, yeah. schooled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so how do you work with with teachers, I guess, away from the students or or, you know, what does that look like for you in terms of like what we call professional development or stuff like yeah. that? But just bringing folks to that theoretical understanding yeah. uh, that for every Thank you for the question. I mean, this is where I live. So, I mean, this has been my work at high tech all these years have been to to work with teachers and work with new teachers, work with teachers who are uh, mid career transfers and so forth to think about. Um, um, we've all experienced K-12 education and we have a mindset about what the teacher does, who the teacher is and what the teacher does and what the sources of authority are and so forth and we need to, need to break those mindsets. Um, so, uh, um, to put it as a thumbnail, what we try to do uh, with teachers, um, both in our work with them as learners and in encouraging them to think in terms of how they think about their work with students, is that the role of this environment and the role of us as actors in the environment is not to predict and control outcomes, but rather to unleash energy for unpredicted uh, outcomes. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two, it's about belonging in a community of learners. So we knew, this is where we get to, this is where we get to really what's really going on here. We knew when we designed High Tech I, we wanted to end teacher isolation. We knew that we would be uh, hiring people who, no matter how much they bought into project-based learning, had never experienced it themselves in a K-12 environment. Um, and so what, what do we do about that? So we knew that when we built the schedule, the first schedule as we opened our doors, that, that we would make room for every student to do an internship and that we would make room, we would build a schedule so that the teachers come to school every day, an hour before the kids arrive. So, and that still holds today. The teachers come to school, they're engaged in various kinds of meetings, full staff looking at student work, small groups designing, uh, tuning projects together, uh, study groups, action groups, talking about issues that the school is facing, and so on. So every day, they're engaged in one way or another in adult conversations about this concrete context that we inhabit. Um, and uh, so that was one thing, it's a structural piece that's there. And then there's this cultural piece also. Uh, if you're new to high tech high as a teacher, no matter whether you have 20 years of teaching, if you're new to high tech high, you undergo an eight day odyssey uh, before school opens in August. And the first piece of that odyssey, the first day, you go out and you do a slice uh, what we call a project slice, where you experience a project and you, you, uh, you uh, exhibit your work at the end of the day or the next morning and so forth, you experience a slice of a project as a learner. And then the next day, veteran teachers come in to, to share 
with small groups of these new teachers a project that they are in the process of designing and they ask for help so that the message is right away. It's not about you're new and I'm senior. It's about we're working together on project design and I need to hear, I need your voice in this. So we're, you're a full participant in the conversations. It's not about you're new so we're gonna put you over here in this class and nobody's ever gonna talk to you, right? So we're all engaged in these conversations together. That's our approach, uh, essentially, uh, to do it. We, we use protocols all the time for safe and structured conversations amongst the adults. And of course, you might imagine what happens to these protocols, they find their way into the classroom because the teachers have found them so valuable working in groups with colleagues that they say, wow, I can use this in my classroom. So uh, protocols for safe and structured uh, uh, conversations around project design, around dilemmas of practice that we face, around looking at student work together, around equity in our projects, and so on. So we are a school reform initiative on the web. You go there, they are, there are protocols for everything, every imaginable of situation, and we use them. So it's time to... Uh, and in your binder. I'm sorry? In your binder. Oh, they're in they your got, binders, too. There's protocols in your binders. There's okay. a whole chapter. So let's go to my... Uh, so, so that's it for questions. I have a couple more things to say. I'm the emperor of rigor, right? So I want to give you my rules for rigor uh, before we go. Uh, no rigor without engagement. No rigor without ownership. No rigor without exemplars. No rigor without audiences. No rigor without purpose. No rigor without dreams. No rigor without passion. No rigor without courage. And no rigor out without fun. Now we had some Israelis who came here, a group uh, to, to, uh, to see High Tech High. And they wanted to know what it was all about. They were from Tel Aviv, and the mayor was there. And we organized a bunch of uh, meetings. And we thought we were going to present this at this meeting, and this at this meeting. The mayor ran every meeting. So Ben Daly, is Ben around? Ben is our CAO and one of the founding members of the, of the group, came to speak to the group before lunch. And he started to talk about his job and his role. And the mayor said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to tell me in one sentence, what you want high tech high students to emerge with when they leave. And Ben thought for just a second, and he said, I want them to be passionate about something. So it so happened that that day, there were presentations of learning going on. And we had some alumni who were back, who are now in college, back on campus to be on panels for these things. So we invited four of them in for lunch. So during lunch, the mayor says to the students, I want you to tell me in one sentence what you emerged from High Tech High with. And the kid sitting right next to him turned to him and said, I can tell you in one word, passion. So as you go out, look for evidence of passion here. And above all, have fun here in these couple of days. Thank you for listening to me and enjoy your time here.